Milka Duno started 42 IndyCar races from 2007 to 2010 with a best finish of only 11th place. In her four-year IndyCar career, she had other drivers calling her a moron, she was put on probation for being too slow, and she's perhaps most well-known for a pit lane shouting match with Danica Patrick. But was she the worst IndyCar racer of all time? In this video, we're going to answer this question while taking a deep dive into the racing career of Milka Duno. Quick disclaimer, my goal in this video is not to just bash Milka Duno. Rather, I want to analyze her career, look at what went right, what went wrong, and cover some details you probably didn't know as objectively as possible. Now, this is my first time doing a video like this, so definitely leave me some feedback on what I can do better in the comments, and let's get right into it. Milka Duno was born on April 22nd, 1972 in Caracas, Venezuela. She got a late start in racing, starting in her mid-20s in the Porsche driving clinics in her native country. However, Milka during this time was instead furthering her education, earning four master's degrees according to her official website, quite a feat when most professional racers don't even hold a single bachelor's degree. Back to racing. Duno's first international racing experience was in the short-lived Women's Global GT Series. This series was an American Le Mans support series run by Don Pano's Racing School using Spec Pano's Esperante cars and featuring a mix of female drivers from amateurs with little experience to ex-Formula One racer Divina Gallica to drivers who achieved some success in sports cars like Cindy Lux and promising young racers like Sarah Sensky. Now, Milka did pretty well for herself in this series, finishing third of 16 drivers in the 1999 championship and fourth in 2000. So overall, a decent start for her professional career. Also during this time, Milka raced part-time in the North American Ferrari Challenge Series. Now, her official website states during this time she won a Ferrari Challenge race, which is significant as this would be her only professional solo win of her career, a pretty significant feat. Now, some people have questioned this win in online forums. However, after a lot of searching, I was finally able to dig up the results and confirm she did in fact win a Ferrari Challenge F355 race in 2000 at Road Atlanta. In 2000, there were separate classes for the F355 and 360 cars, and it appears the F355 class was the less competitive, but she still came out on top in a field of 13 drivers and was the fastest in the field that day by half a second. Even considering I don't think any of the drivers in the field had success at the higher professional levels, I still think it's quite an achievement, especially considering she'd only been racing a few years at this point. Milka also posted some pretty solid results in her other Ferrari Challenge races, even in 1999, where there was a more competitive single class. Also interesting, Milka was disqualified along with another driver while battling for the lead of the race for aggressive driving, quite different from how she'd be parked from IndyCar 10 years later. Now, I found something else interesting about another driver in Ferrari Challenge, but I'll save that for the end of the video. So stick around to the end if you're interested in that and a few other interesting things I discovered during my research. So after a year or two racing sports cars, Milka moved to open wheel racing for the first time in the Barber Dodge Pro Series. A switch from sports cars or touring cars to open wheel is always tough, so with no karting experience or other significant open wheel experience, it's no surprise that success did not continue for Milka into Barber Dodge. The Barber Dodge series was a very competitive feeder to the kart series at the time. Duno only managed a best finish of 17th in her eight races that season, failing to score a single point, which were paid all the way down to 15th place. She finished well behind future IndyCar champion Ryan hunter Ray, who finished fifth in the championship that year, and also well behind less successful future IndyCar racers Roger Yasukawa in 7th and Alex Sparafico in 9th. Now, there was one future IndyCar racer she was on par with, Scott Mayer, who also finished with 0 points in 8 starts that year. Now, Scott Mayer's IndyCar career is probably worthy of another video. Let's just say it didn't go so well. Now, in 2000, in the Barber Dodge Pro Series, Duno finished ahead of Mayer in three of the five races they both started, so she did beat a future in 
but Milka didn't let disappointing open wheel results stop her from joining the World Series by Nissan for 2001. This European based series was one of the most prominent developmental formulas in Europe for many years, with several graduates heading straight to Formula One. Now, 2001 wasn't the series' most competitive year, but still featured solid competition, including two future IndyCar racers, Frank Martigny and Thomas Schechter, who finished 1-2 in the championship. Considering the competitiveness of the European feeder series, combined with a step up in speed and downforce from Barbara Dodge, it's no surprise Duno finished tied for 24th in the championship, scoring just a single point for one 10th place finish. But considering her rather dismal season in Barbara Dodge, I'd actually say this was a sign of improvement and another positive sign she did improve her finishing position throughout the year. For 2002, she smartly stepped down to the support series, then called Formula Nissan 2000, something more suitable for her experience level, although she still only earned a single championship point for the year. For 2003, she showed some signs of improvement, finishing 11th in the championship with 28 points, and notably beating another driver, none other than Chanuk Nasani, probably the slowest F1 driver in modern time. Despite poor results in the open wheel developmental series, Duno was faring better in sports cars. Milka stepped straight into the big leagues of endurance racing in the American Le Mans series in late 2000. By the end of the year, she co-drove a Dodge Viper in the GTS class to a podium finish in the race of a thousand years in Adelaide, Australia, although only four cars started in the class. For 2001, she would move to the new LMP 675 class part-time, co-driving a Dick Barber racing Reynard Judd, where she and her team managed several class wins, although there were typically not more than a few cars entered in the new class. In her first 24 hours of Le Mans, the team would retire after only four laps. By 2002, it was time to join the premier class in Le Mans racing, LMP 900. Throughout the season, Duno shared several different cars, but with many more entries in LMP 900, the best result she could manage was fifth in class for a DNF at Road America. By 2004, Duno was racing full-time in the rival Grand Am Rolex sports car series, bringing her ubiquitous Sitgo sponsorship, which would follow her for many years. The next two years would be the most successful of her racing career. Usually teamed with veteran endurance racer Andy Wallace, Duno would accrue three overall wins, 10 top fives over the 2004 and 2005 seasons. She would continue in the series in 2006 and the beginning of 2007, although her results would slip with the change of team and co-driver. While there are no official statistics on how many laps each driver completed, one can guess Duno did not complete very many compared to her experienced and established co-drivers, especially considering the 30-minute rule, which requires all drivers to drive at least 30 minutes to earn points, did not exist until 2008. That takes us to 2007 when, despite lackluster open wheel results in the developmental series earlier in her career, Milka would move with her Samax Grand Am team and Sitgo sponsorship to the IndyCar series. Milka would run a partial season on all ovals and her IndyCar career got off to a surprisingly solid start. In her first race, she would finish 14th at Kansas, albeit six laps down. At Indy, in just her second IndyCar race, she passed her rookie test and qualified solidly for the field on day three. Drivers she outqualified included five-time Indy 500 starter Jimmy Kite and three-time Indy 500 starter and F1 and kart series veteran Roberto Moreno. Now come race day, like many Indy 500 rookies, she crashed out of the race on lap 65. In her next race at Texas, she would achieve her best finish of her IndyCar career, finishing 11th seven laps down. Now, I need to note, Milka would have better races in her following years, but due to increased competition in bigger fields, she never beat this 11th place finish. However, the season took a turn for the worse in the next two rounds at Iowa and Richmond, two difficult short ovals, which saw Milka parked for being too slow. Unfortunately, she'd face more of that in the coming years. Duno ended out the season with a mechanical DNF at Michigan and a 15th place at Chicagoland. 
So overall, Milka showed pretty decent aptitude for super speedway over racing in 2007, which was important because these tracks consisted of around 50% of the IRL schedule at the time. Although she wasn't very competitive yet, we don't really know how good her equipment was under the single car Samax team. Perhaps more importantly, for the most part, she finished races and stayed out of trouble. The short ovals were another story, which we'll get into more. In 2008, Samex was gone from IndyCar, but that was hardly a problem. Duno took her sponsorship monies to Dreyer and Reinbold, a mid-pack team. She would also have a teammate for the first time and former Indy 500 winner, Buddy Rice, to share data with, which can be a critical benefit for a new driver's success. Now, the field was a lot bigger and more competitive this year following the merger between the IRL and Champ Car Series. So given all this, did Milka Duno show improvement? In her first race of the season at Homestead, Milka finished 20th of 25 cars. Let's take a deep dive into this race and see what really happened. First off, Milka qualified in 18th. On the surface, that seems mediocre, but she was only one mile an hour slower than her teammate Buddy Rice and ahead of five other drivers, including Will Power in his second oval start. But many say Milka was a better qualifier than racer. That's what I seem to remember, so I was kind of expecting her to drop like a rock in the opening laps of the race. Instead, at the start of the race, she moved up to 13th. I was pretty amazed by this performance. After a caution for debris, a pit stop cycle and restart, she dropped to 17th. But a few laps later, she was back up to 15th, making at least one competitive pass. After a green flag cycle of pit stops, she was still in 15th, two laps down, while Buddy Rice was 12th, one lap down. There was then a long green flag run, and after another green flag pit cycle, Duno was now 16th, four laps down, but only eight drivers remained on the lead lap. This was a decent performance up to this point. Certainly not one we'd expect from the worst any car driver of all time. I knew from the results that Duno crashed out of the race soon after this, and I noticed Ryan Briscoe crashed out around the same time, so I was wondering what happened and thinking it may have been a poor move by Duno causing a collision. Now, in actuality here, we see she just got loose and lost control on her own. So yes, she crashed out of the race, but in a very typical non-climactic way that every driver does at some point. She probably didn't have a great car considering Buddy Rice was two laps down and her handling probably just went away when she lost it. I was interested to hear what she had to say about the race and how her car was handling, but unfortunately there isn't an interview with her in the TV broadcast. So overall, even though this was a bad result, it wasn't a terrible race for Milka. Continuing her season at Kansas, Milka finished five laps down in 16th. Then at Indy, she qualified solidly 27th for her second Indy 500, just a few miles an hour slower than her teammates, Townsend Bell, who started 12th, and Buddy Rice, who started 17th. She finished her first Indy 500, although for her, it was actually the Indy 462.5 because she did finish 15 laps down, although she was not the last car running. At Texas, she finished just two laps down in 17th, of 28 drivers for a solid performance in a race with eight cautions to help bunch the field. Then came Iowa, where she completed only 26 laps before retiring due to handling, so her lack of performance on short ovals continued. But we should note, Buddy Rice also retired after just 78 laps for handling, as did two other drivers later in the race, so this wasn't as bad as it sounds. She was probably the worst in this race, but not the worst by a mile. Then came Milka's first IndyCar road race at Watkins Glen. Would Milka's endurance road racing experience pay off? Well, she was slowest in qualifying, one second slower than Jay Howard, and seven seconds off the pole time, and she then crashed out of the race after 45 laps. After finishing 17th at Nashville, three laps down, it was off to the Mid-Ohio road course, where she was again off the pace. Milka did manage to finish her first road course race six laps down in 23rd, the last running car. But the weekend was highlighted by a spat with Dana Kirkpatrick in the pits after practice, which went viral and is probably the most memorable moment of Milka Duno's IndyCar career. Danica confronts Milka angrily, accusing her of not seeing her. Milka says she saw her. Now, I can't blame Milka and her team for being defensive, but I also understand Danica's frustration for being blocked by a slower car, and I'll just leave this at that. After a crash at Kentucky, Milka would have her first street course start at Detroit, where she DNF. 
Now, she would qualify almost seven seconds off the pole, but she was just two seconds off the pace of both Conquest cars and four seconds off her teammate, which was her best road course qualifying effort for the year. Now, let's jump to the first lap of the race, and we see here, oh, Milka has somehow managed to spin out in just the first lap. And now we get to see the replay, and oh, we see, oh, Bruno Junqueiro attempts an inside move on Milka Duno, and Milka turns in and they touch. Now, reviewing the video, it doesn't appear Junqueiro has fully established his position. So although I think it would be a smart move to not hold up a faster driver on the first lap of the race, I can't put the blame on Milka for this incident. To round out the season, Milka had her breakthrough performance of the year with a 14th place finish at Chicagoland in a 28 car field, finishing only one lap down. She would actually lead the first five laps of her IndyCar career in this race, and they weren't under yellow, but they were due to pitting out of sequence. Overall, the 2008 season was not that bad. Milka showed improvement on the super speedways, and while the short ovals and road courses were still a huge struggle, she still hadn't gotten a lot of experience on those tracks in her two partial years. 2009 saw rumors of Milka Duno joining Newman Haas Lanigan Racing, which faced a lot of criticism from fans. But the reality was a lot of mid-pack teams were struggling in the recession and looking to fill their seats with pay drivers. Newman Haas Lanigan, although an established team with a lot of success in Champ Car, was no exception. Duno ran a preseason test with the team, but a ride failed to materialize. Duno would end up landing back at Dreyer and Reinbold for another part-time season, running nine races, six super speedways, and three road courses. Rookie Mike Conway would replace Buddy Rice as her teammate. In Duno's first race of the season at Kansas, she qualified solidly in 12th, ahead of her teammate in 16th. However, in the race, she faded fast at the start and ran near the back of the pack for most of the day. She finished the race in 16th, the second-to-last car running, ahead of only Stanton Barrett. Unfortunately for Milka, this would be her best finish of the year. Her progress on the super speedways from the last two seasons appeared to stall. She was five laps or more down at the finish of every super speedway race she finished, with the exception of Indy, where she managed to complete 497.5 miles. Yes, she finished the Indy 500 only one lap down, However, it was a race filled with cautions, and she was still the last car running in 20th place. Perhaps Dryan Reinbald's super speedway setup took a hit with the departure of Buddy Rice. But I was hopeful to see some promising improvement on road course pace from Milka. Teammate Mike Conway had a strong pace on road courses, but unfortunately, Milka didn't show any improvement in qualifying. If anything, she regressed. Milka qualified as the slowest car, 5 to 8 seconds off the pole, on all of her three road courses about the same as the year before. But while the previous year saw her sometimes within a few seconds of the next slowest car, the rest of the field was getting more competitive, leaving Milka a rather embarrassing three to four seconds off the pace of the rest of the back of the pack. That, bring back. that brings us to 2010, where Duna would take her Sitco sponsorship to Dale Coyne, a small team who was mostly a backmarker for many years, but had increasing success in the few years prior, even winning a race in 2009 with Justin Wilson. However, the team reportedly lost some key personnel, and Duno was paired with rookie Alex Lloyd for her first full-time campaign in the series. This was going to be a big challenge for Milka. The series now had a majority 9 of 17 races on road or street courses, where Milka had never shown any competitiveness in an IndyCar. The season started with four road and street courses. In her best qualifying effort, Duna managed to qualify only around five seconds off the pole and three seconds off the rest of the pack. She finished these races with one crash, two early retirements due to handling, and one second to last place finish. At Long Beach, she wouldn't even attempt qualifying, saying, we just don't have the speed yet, and out of respect for the other drivers who do and want to qualify well for their sponsors and fans, it was the right decision. Next came a string of four super speedways, Milka's bread and butter, but things didn't go so well. At Kansas, she was running in 23rd when she had this strange incident in pit road, which led to a mechanical DNF. Reviewing the video, I will say it appears to be Milka's fault, but did the sponsor communicate that there were two cars to her inside? This is definitely a situation where a driver needs to rely on their spotter, and it's unclear if there was a communication breakdown. 
at Indy, she was one of four cars that failed to qualify, missing the Indy 500 for the first time in her career. At Texas, she suffered another mechanical DNF after hitting debris. And at Iowa, we shouldn't be surprised that she made it only 31 laps before retiring for handling. At Watkins Glen, Milka finally made headlines, but not for the reasons she wanted. Ryan hunter Ray accused Milka of blocking him during qualifying and confronted her in the pits about it, similar to Danica Patrick two years back at Mid-Ohio. The media ate up the story and several negative articles ran over the next few weeks with quotes from other drivers about Milka's uncompetitiveness. Duno was placed on probation for not consistently meeting minimum performance standards. According to IndyCar, this meant being within 107% of the leading car on road and street courses and within 10 miles an hour of the leading car on ovals. Whether good or bad, Milka would close out the season pretty unspectacularly, not posting any good results, but also not making many boneheaded moves. She would retire due to handling from the next two races at Toronto and Edmonton after only two and 10 laps respectively. I'm not sure if the team retired her proactively or if she was parked by race officials. At Sonoma in Mid-Ohio, she would finish the races maintaining the minimum performance standards. Mid-Ohio would be the only race she would attempt to qualify for, and she was, by my calculations, just a few tenths outside of the 107% rule, but I guess officials rounded down and let her race. The season would end with four super speedways, but Milka would qualify and finish near the back. At the season finale in Homestead, she would crash out after 170 laps, ending her race, season, and IndyCar career. Milka would make the switch to stock car racing, running part-time in ARCA for 2011 and 2012, before a full-time season in 2013, where she would finish seventh in the championship with two top tens. For me, this was the highlight of her racing career. Watching Milka battle it out in the pack on the short tracks of the ARCA series, she looked pretty at home and nothing like a driver put on probation for being too slow. Perhaps the heavier stock car was more suited for her driving style. Now, I'm not claiming ARCA is the most competitive series and perhaps her performance in the Nationwide series shows this. Milka would attempt four Nationwide series races in 2014, failing to qualify for two, crashing out at Kansas and finishing 34th at Homestead. This would mark the end of her professional racing career. I've never met Milka, but she's generally regarded as good with fans, a positive role model for young girls, and a fan favorite in her sports car days. She started the Milka Way program in 2004 to inspire and motivate students around the world, and she even wrote a children's book. I have to give her credit for using her platform to do good. Fans, and even some media, accused Milka of a lot over the years. Was she deserving of this criticism? I think it depends. Was she careless? Did she not hold her line? Did she fail to use her mirrors? After doing my research, unless the TV cameras missed a lot of close calls, in my opinion, mostly not. Did she have dangerous moments where she got in the way? Yes, but from what I saw, not more than some other backmarkers way off the pace. Did she lack effort? We don't know. But how committed were her teams to her driver development? Was she a ride buyer? Yes, she had the funding and teams were gladly willing to take it and put her in a seat. We have to accept that that's just how racing goes. At the same time, can I understand the driver complaints against her? Of course, even I know the frustration of being blocked in qualifying and at the IndyCar level, it makes sense to expect a certain level of performance in the field. Was Milka Duno a bad IndyCar driver? Yes, there's no way around that. Even in her best results, she was only beating a few drivers. But was she the worst driver of all time? No, I don't think so. Consider the early years of racing, it wasn't uncommon for gentlemen drivers to show up to professional races with a car and not a lot of skill, even through the 70s and 80s. They just didn't stand out as much because the racing wasn't as close. Was she the worst driver of her era? I would say Milko was the worst driver to last four seasons and 43 races. But considering all drivers to start an IndyCar race from the mid 2000s to early 2010s, I'd say Milka has some pretty strong competition for worst from some other drivers, including some I mentioned in this video. Milka was just a bad driver who managed to stick around the longest. At the beginning of her career, there were small champ car teams that hadn't figured out the Dallara chassis yet, 
and IRL era oval specialists who weren't adept to the highest level of road course racing. By 2010, there weren't many of these drivers left. Almost all teams and drivers were competing for podiums. And then there was Milka Duno. Her performance, or lack thereof, really started to stand out. If you made it to the end, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. That's my take on Milka Duno's career, 100% as an IndyCar fan. I did a lot of research, but I don't have any inside information. If you agree or disagree, feel free to leave a comment. If I have enough interest, I like to make this a series where I highlight some other lesser known IndyCar drivers. So please let me know who you're interested in, and I'll see you in my next video.